8302 court, and we'll continue on next year. So uh, I believe that we've uh, started a fine tradition, and I hope that you feel the same way about it. Uh, we've had a series of excellent speakers throughout the semester who engage both timely and relevant topics, but never more so has that been the case than today, where Dr. Kasamayashi but focusing in and around uh, North Dallas. He is a lecturer at the University of Texas at Dallas, at Collin County College, at Richland College, and he is our distinguished guest today at Brookhaven College. Um, the topic of the discussion will be revolutionary movements uh, in North Africa and the Middle East, and he will be focusing on Egypt and Tunisia in particular to use them as illustrative case studies to help all of us understand what is dominating the headlines today and that is the topic that we are studying currently, American foreign policy in this volatile and changing part of the world. Hopefully after today we'll have a better appreciation on what is happening there and how we can help carve a future foreign policy which will maintain mm -hmm. stability and peace in that part of the world. So please welcome Dr. Ayashi. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ahad. And, um, Thank you all for coming. It is always a pleasure to talk about the Middle East here in Texas. Okay, uh, we're, we're far oceans apart from uh, that region. Yet, I mean, I've been around for like three of, in four or five colleges locally, and there is always interest, you know, to listen, understand, and basically have an appreciation, uh, like Ahad, Professor Ahad said, uh, of that region and what are the dynamics that are behind these political changes that are taking place. And the title of my uh, presentation today has to do with the development that are taking place in that particular region uh, since December 17. Sorry, I made a mistake. Since many, many, many years, okay? Uh, it is not really a development that took place today. Uh, perhaps what happened these weeks and these past few months uh, is a culmination of what's been going on uh, in the previous years. So my emphasis would be on the nature of mass politics in the region, particularly North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, the talk would focus mainly on Arab countries uh, because the developments do affect significantly uh, the Arab countries. Uh, depending on who your teacher is, uh, the Middle East could include Turkey, other nations like uh, uh, Iran and so on. Uh, but uh, our focus today would be mainly on the uh, Arab nations. And who knows, okay, these are, this is a developing story, and I did call my presentation a, a developing story. Who knows, by the end of this conversation today, another perhaps nation would rise up in that region against its dictator, okay? Uh, we don't know, things are very much fluid. Uh, they're going so fast. Even the United States, the CIA, many other intelligence, uh, you know, uh, services all over in the uh, developed nations have been caught by surprise uh, because of what's going on. Uh, so, as I said, you never know what, what would be the next. Uh, as we speak today, things are going pretty well and bad in Syria and Libya, as well as in Yemen. Uh, so, uh, my talk would be basically a little bit touching on the facts, what happened. Some of you may already know what's going on uh, by watching the news, reading stuff on the internet, watching on YouTube and all that. Uh, so, I might be saying things that you already know. Uh, but I would give you a perspective from someone who's been a native or who's a native of Tunisia. I was born there, uh, lived in the U.S. for like 15 plus years, and I've done my high school years in Tunisia, then went to France uh, where I got my bachelor, and then moved to the United States where I focused more on politics. Uh, so I would give you a, a pretty much a, a remote kind of witness uh, of the situation. I've been following the news in Tunisia, particularly since day one, uh, to the point that... Uh, uh, my daughter, who's uh, checking her email on a daily basis, like every teenager here, uh, anytime she goes to Yahoo and she would see something about Tunisia that she's never saw before. So this is a tiny country uh, that started the whole, you know, revolution, uh, yet we've never heard about it, at least here in the United States. It does not really present a strategic kind of uh, uh, entity to the United States or to the West as a whole, yet this revolution, which is now, uh, you know, covered globally, uh, has started in that tiny country of 10 uh, million people or so. So, uh, as, I, as, as uh, Professor Ahad said, I would be talking in, in general, and I will take the case of Tunisia and Egypt as il illustrations for, for you guys to understand better uh, what happened specifically in those two nations who, you know, uh, thank God the revolutions had made it through, and those dictators has, 
have been pushed out of power. Uh, so these are the two best case scenarios if you talk about revolutions that took place because it, the same revolutions are happening in other nations, yet uh, we have not seen the result that uh, we've seen in Egypt, in Tunisia, and then in Egypt. So if you look at the literature all right, that talks about the Middle East and specifically about the Arab nations, uh, it is a literature that looks at the prospects of politics from a pessimistic view, right? Uh, and, and there is a reason for that. I mean, the status quo has been going on for decades. Uh, so when we talk about dictatorships in the Arab world, we're not talking about 10, 20 years. We're talking about as, ba as far back as the independence, uh, you know, years when each of these countries has gained its independence. More specifically, Tunisia gained its independence in 1956 from the French. Uh, Egypt also uh, gained in, in its independence uh, in the 1940s uh, from the British and so on. So the idea here is that you thought that by gaining independence, these nations would engage in a more kind of open uh, democratic politics, uh, but that's not been the case. And I mean, there is an explanation for that because when you start your nation building after being kind of uh, colonized for so many years, you didn't have the levies uh, of power in, in your hands and you've been basically following whatever the colonial power is dictating on you, uh, of course you try to go back and build, rebuild the economy, rebuild the institutions and whatnot. Uh, so the call there was pretty much motivated by a tone that is anti-colonial, uh, a tone that is anti-repression uh, and so on. So a lot of these Arab masses, if you will, have followed their leaders uh, with blind eyes. I mean, blindfolded, if you will. They did not question any of the, uh, any of the uh, motivations you know, uh, within the, uh, you know, the politics led by these leaders. So in a way, the, the, the literature has given up you know, uh, on, on the Arab politics, uh, thinking that the status quo would never change. Uh, people would not rise up against these dictators, and uh, simply because uh, there is a mechanism that motivates those uh, leaders and, and, and kind of dictate on them to keep reinventing themselves to accommodate the calls, the needs of the people, uh, the pressure sometimes from the international community and whatnot. So they were what we call the reinvented authoritarianism, basically. They would present themselves as democracies or as the most uh, you know, advocates of uh, democratic you know, institutions. And they would explain this or justify it by the uh, now and so hand holding of elections, which we all know by now that these were like windows dressing kind of elections more than any actual fact uh, and, and, and legitimate really call for change or alternation of power and things like that. All right, so they would engage in such policies. They might engage in other economic policies uh, to kind of uh, appeal and appease to the populace and uh, trying to uh, create jobs, focus on the economy, and so on. So that is one of the reasons why these people or these dictators have maintained power. Okay? The other thing that the literature gives is the fact that there is a lot of connection between religion and politics in many of these nations, particularly when we talk about Islam. And many of the authors have blamed the status quo in the Middle East and the lack of you know, uh, uh, revolutions, if you will, lack of instauration of democratic politics on the fact that Islam does not call for that and Islam does call for the, uh, rather for the uh, obedience. It is so much subduing the communities uh, you'd have really to listen to the ruler and, and many, you know, religious uh, uh, persons and leaders have faced, you know, as we speak today, you can Google, you know, the, those, uh, uh, you know, uh, sheikh and uh, uh, religious leader in Saudi Arabia are saying, in Egypt itself, many of them have instituted fatwas, which is like a, a religious uh, decree that would say it is against Islam who revolt against so all of these uh, contributed in addition to the fact that the middle class was very much either co-opted right, uh, by the government itself. In other words, the middle class did not have that kind of independence that we saw maybe uh, in other regions such as Latin America or Europe, which helped a lot, you know, a sense of uprising against the uh, ruling elite. Okay? And the last effort they made was to co-opt many of the institutions. And again, this also falls within the... Uh, idea of reinvented authoritarianism, 
where many of those dictators would basically create parallel institutions uh, that are there to kind of uh, serve their interests. For example, Tunisia has been known to be the leading Arab nation in terms of its uh, union kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, power and uh, how much they could threaten the uh, regimes and so on. When Ben Ali came in in 1987, of course, this is something that Bourguiba before him did not do because he couldn't dare create a parallel union. So what Ben Ali did, he created a parallel union and also he tried to infiltrate uh, those union organizations with people that are pro his regime so that they would not create as much of a threat as uh, they did in perhaps other more advanced nations, okay? So in a nutshell, I mean, the literature is a bit kind of uh, uh, negative with regard to any political change, any political developments in, in, in the region that would make sense in the democratic, you know, perspective. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we can look at the Arab world as, as, a, as, as, as a component, okay? Uh, again, there is a lot of things that unify those Arab nations, even though we're talking about different nations, borders, and whatnot, yet they shared a lot of these similar things, okay? 350 million people, ranging from North Africa up all the way to the, uh, you know, the Middle East there. And many of these nations, they share a lot of the things in common, including culture, language, uh, you know, historic development in terms of colonialism, the Turkish Empire there, and whatnot. All right. So it is really an entity in a way, but only the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the colonial power presence there had dictated the fact that they should be separated, that they would go from really small emirates like you know, the United Arab Emirates or Bahrain, which is a tiny island, uh, to much larger countries like you know, Egypt or Sudan and whatnot. All right. These nations, all right, they've had their own grievances. Okay. And that's why early on I said, uh, that these countries or these revolutions are not the uh, kind of the result of, of yesterday, but they've been really a, an accumulation of so many years. So these nation, or these people, they share a lot of the grievances. More specifically, uh, a lot of antagonism vis-a-vis -vis the ruling elite. Okay, and many efforts. Uh, I can give you an example. I was in Tunisia in the 1978, and uh, the government there decided to raise the prices of bread and other staples that used to be subsidized by the government. And boom, I mean, we had a revolution. Basically, everybody took to the street. We're talking about essential products that everybody buys on a daily basis. So if you're going to double the price of these staples, then people will not be able to afford to buy pay them. So what happened, people took to the streets and for days and many got killed in those events. The army had to be used to crush down this movement. Uh, and, and, and it was all over. The president b back then was Bourguiba. He came back and on TV and he said, okay, we decided to flip back the prices to the way they were before. And everybody was happy with that. Okay, so he calmed all the spirits. It was an economic, you know, if you will, uh, revolution that was short-lived. Okay. Uh, so the same, in, the same happened in Jordan. The same. Uh, so those were like more economic motivated revolutions, okay? Now, what other issues that these regimes or these uh, sorry, people suffer from or complain about is the key question of legitimacy. I mean, we've had elections, we've had a lot of the so, so, you know, so-called democratic uh, you know, uh, gestures by these regimes, yet none of these presidents has been elected you know, in a legitimate election and then kind of gave to another one. So there is an alternative of power. Falsify the elections. Uh, we can intimidate people. In, in the, recent, the most recent election uh, they had, people were even intimidated from going to vote in areas uh, that were thought to be pro anti candidates. And to prevent those people from going there was vote than the regime candidate in those districts, okay, so as far uh, as that. So a sense of negative things that you felt for more than like three days. Okay? So how do we explain this? How do we explain it? There is independence. If you look at the Arab world in general, and uh, I could challenge anyone who would give me a comment here, you could see that everything revolves around the elite, 
Okay, so the ruling elite, to other maybe democratic nations, uh, where you have a separation of uh, uh, powers, you would have a separation of uh, institutions, some kind of uh, independence, you know, in, in what they could and could not do, some kind of constitutional accountability. Uh, that's not the case in many of these Arab nations, right? So the state is the ruling elite, it is at the same time uh, the party in power, right? And you go from there. The economy, uh, the business opportunities, the investment opportunities are all scrutinized <laughs> itself. So you'd have to be really pro-regime uh, to be able, for example, to invest. And as we speak, a lot of the French uh, uh, media outlets have talked now about the corruption in Tunisia and how the family of the ruling party, Ben Ali's families uh, and his wife, were able to, you know, secure a lot of the uh, foreign investments, you know, that come in and they would ask them to basically pay 30%, 40% on each kind of investment project as a profit that they would gain uh, for themselves, you know, rather than, uh, you know, the, the people that are investing. So security forces are held, you know, and they are manipulated and directed by the ruling elite and so on. So this is really a dramatic issue and it's been the main reason why uh, we've had these manifestations of people's power that we see in uh, many of those uh, Arab nations. Okay, so these are like some example of pictures and uh, this comes back to a United, I mean African Union summit and uh, no, one of those summits that took place between the Arab nations uh, uh, African nations here and you would see that everybody is having fun doing themselves, okay? Uh, so, my two examples Tunisia and, and Egypt and Tunisia is, is a tiny uh, it's got a very much highly educated population because uh, one of the uh, tenets of Bourdieu all the way to 1987 uh, has been to promote two things, mainly education and uh, women. So these were like the main uh, kind of uh, uh, tenets of his, his policy, his regime. Was he a democratic leader? Far from that. He was not a democratic leader. He was like uh, a, a, a one-man show uh, to the point that he called himself the supreme combatant. All right? The title that he gave himself, uh, the media, everything else was working out to promote his views and uh, you know he was like uh, basically the, 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 the king of, of, of everything if you will okay uh, in 1987 uh, Bourguiba was pushed away by a military uh, uh, one of his aides who's the, 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 he came in and he said uh, Bourguiba is deemed too old and we have to basically move him out on the health grounds that he uh, used and he called in like six, seven, uh, you know, physicians and they've signed a document that the current president is not eligible anymore uh, to lead the nation. In 1980, Ali came in with a lot of the promises as we might expect and he said we will go with we'll transition to democracy. Uh, he came up with a national chart on which many of the opposition parties have signed on and uh, everybody had uh, been excited basically to really join in give him a chance to move the country from a one-man control to a more kind of a democratic uh, control case and that was short-lived because as soon as a few months into his uh, power or uh, leadership he the status quo that the opposition uh, parties are not really uh, they mean business basically and th that's something that he was not pretty much satisfied with and the number were put in jail uh, we're talking 25 plus years to basically exile uh, live in, in other uh, European nations that is a lot of time, and we're talking about uh, 23 years of dictatorship. If during his rule, Ben Ali has been more than uh, Bourguiba himself, and many people now 
a Bourguiba rule. See, because police were on the top of everything. The media, the security forces, a, a very much, uh, uh, a very much uh, robust system that is mainly intended to do two things. Uh, uh, but sometimes you go to the Washington Post newspaper, the advertisements about the Tunisian or the Tunisian, uh, like a lot of like PR institutions that were intended to promote the image of Tunisia in the world. All right. The other thing is to crack down, you know, uh, monitoring conversations and all these kind of things. That any uh, to what extent uh, the people. So this has, which was pretty bad, ended in a lot of anger and uh, started to really uh, shake up a little bit. The 2011, when we had this gentleman here, and I might be a little bit, uh, you know, uh, sensitive here. So uh, what happened this event is basically uh, the culmination of the whole thing. Uh, Mohammed Bozizi, who is a street vendor, no way to gain a like any idiot. Uh, he was affiliated, his vending cart was taken away from him. in one of the middle south of Tunisia. So he did not start in the capital. Right? It is one of the people are struggling and more than the uh, youth are unemployed. He, he self-emulated to put gas on himself just uh, to basically uh, uh, revolt against the police lady. It is his van de car. So this was the broken revolution. You might minimize it level, but that's what happened. That's what happened. Uh, as soon as with the, uh, the suit, from your left with the suit, the peas, uh, you know, the trash about what happened to and uh, I didn't really uh, resolve. Okay. And then since then, demonstrations uh, uh, you know, early when many Bozizi has died in the hospital bed, and that really created and little by little, and what made things was the I mean, the use by the police of bullets, which created uh, kind of victims and first the police crashing the movement uh, in such a way. What I want to do here is just to change a little bit is uh, these are like uh, two minutes or less um, presentation. It is like according to Al Jazeera, uh, what kind of, uh, it's like someone a central of how things around and I would know they've heard uh, up until maybe they reach a certain level in Africa in a home a phone made
uh, you will see that they've conducted the same checklist. You know, when you have a crisis in any business or a, you know uh, in any particular industry, you're going to go through you know a number of uh, efforts. You know, as a checklist where you you try number one, then you know, that's it, then you go you go number two, and, and so on. So th they they've made the same kind of path. They follow the same path in a way. All right, whether calling these demonstrators as uh, foreign you know agents. Uh, calling them terrorists, calling them extremists, uh, you know, it, it, it is really the same language that they've used all over, okay? Um, and then that didn't work, then they started on the crackdown using extreme force, snipers, killing uh, employees of even camels and horses in Egypt uh, to kind of smash the demonstrators in St. Louis squares and things like that, then coming back and making like pleas for concessions and uh, telling the people that all the ones with you that uh, are, are been serving the nation for so many years, I have nothing out of this. Uh, kind of trying to uh, widen their image and basically present themselves as a, as a good moral leaders more than anything else. But because of the lack of trust, because of the absence of any kind of you know uh, confidence in these leaders and what they're saying, uh, none of these you know uh, demonstrators and opposition. Uh, parties have kind of agreed to what these uh, leaders are promising. So basically, they've determined that there is no way out of, of this crisis uh, besides the president you know, stepping down and having new elections and, and things like that. And that was the end game in Egypt as well. Hosni Mubarak, at the end of the day, asked for three speech to be televised on TV, and everybody was going to accept him until he leaves office uh, from the first speech. But he took longer than that. But at the end, he basically uh, had to uh, step down. Now, I just want to show you uh, to what extent these uh, regimes could be the violence that we were mentioning early on. Uh, they're ready to basically disregard the pri precious human life. Uh, they're ready to kill. Uh, they're ready to smash. They're ready to destroy individuals, uh, human beings, uh, by their private accords that they are using there to kind of frighten people. So what I have in this video here is a couple of uh, cars that were, one of them is a police car, the other one is a, a van that was used by pro regime, pro Mubarak, and both incidents took place in Egypt. And it would show you to what extent these kind of uh, individuals disregard the human life because they're running through the protesters just like that. So this is one of them here. And I, I, I don't maximize it because I'm still maximizing it. So. <laughs> This is said to show a police van in Cairo. You see people in the street rushing to get out of the way of the vehicle. It appears to hit a couple pedestrians, and it never stops. So, so we're talking about violence here. I mean, you could see the answer in front of your eyes. These are like uh, regime, you know, advocates, and, and they're really working hard to basically do whatever is possible for them. Uh, to maintain power or keep the regime in place and so on and so on, okay? Uh, all right, a couple of words on what happened in other nations. It is pretty much a replication of what happened in Tunisia and, uh, you know, in Egypt. Uh, things moved again to Libya, and many, many people, uh, analysts did not expect Libya to basically apply uh, just or rise up against the comrade that they quit, okay? But yet, things happened in Libya as well. Uh, it, it is pretty much a regime that's been entrenched in security uh, and it's been 
concerns the uh, playing a tribal game, basically, if you allow one tribe to lead. And it is, it's been a one-man show, you know, since the 1960s, uh, uh, where Mama Sadat has kind of revolted against the, uh, you know, the ruler before him and decided to maintain power. And, and this uses the case, in a way, when the apartheid started, is that I'm not in charge. And he said this, by the way, many, many times on TV, that I'm just a regular British individual. Uh, I, I'm not really in power. I, I'm, I'm, I'm part of you guys. So it is like a language that uh, perhaps the youth of today would not really uh, buy into uh, that easily, okay? Uh, he also blames terrorists, Al-Qaeda, that they have really, uh, you know, used these as a way to square up the system, revolt against them and whatnot. And uh, he even said that uh, uh, there are a number of foreign countries contributing, you know, killed to the Libyan people uh, that would make them kind of revolt and go crazy and uh, things like that, okay? Uh, this, this happened also in other nations, uh, uh, you know, and uh, as we know today, I mean, things are going bad in, in Syria, pretty much bad, and in, 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 uh, in Yemen as well, and uh, uh, in Bahrain to a certain part. Uh, but again, some other regimes have taken a preventive way to, you know, avoid these uh, revolutions from taking place in their own backyard, uh, specifically by conducting certain, you know, uh, policies that would uh, maybe improve the condition, the economic conditions of their citizens, uh, giving away, uh, you know, uh, giving away certain uh, kickbacks, and, and we have some examples on the slide here where uh, in, 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 uh, in Oman, for example, they doubled almost the uh, minimum wage, you know, uh, at one time, uh, Saudi Arabia gave a lot of the, uh, the biggest they gave a lot of the billions to basically help with unemployment and uh, youth programs and things like that. Uh, in Iraq, also the Prime Minister promised not to run for office again, and uh, so, I mean, this, this, in a way, these monumental uh, events, this shapes the, the way things were going in many of these, uh, at least in the mind of many of those leaders, and it really prompted them uh, to take action and try to avoid, you know, uh, the uh, dilemma that's been uh, going on with Saudi and, and, and Tunisia and, uh, and Egypt, okay? One, one other dimension of these events, and, and this is really the most interesting one, is the effect of social media. Okay, I, I, I participated in a forum at Teach for Dallas, and there was a professor by the name of David Dave Perry. He teaches like emerging media and things like that, and he talked extensively about the effects of the internet uh, on, on these revolutions, and, and there is no question about that. Right, there is really, I would express in this, yes. saying where it is, it is in terms of its location or you're talking about well, it seems like it's just it seems like uh, there is an abundance to go around and yeah. without being able to really spread that's true. but it's just giving three thousand dollars like that I don't know. yeah and, and keep in mind Kuwait is uh, is not a huge does not have a huge population so three thousand is not if we had the same here in the US or we have three hundred million people that's just some stuff you know uh, budgets and all that uh, but yeah, the money is there, and, and if, you, if you read the news these days, you would see how much you know each of these presidents has outside the nation. In terms of billions of dollars, uh, it is thought that Sadat has like about $41 billion overseas in bank accounts and things like that. So <coughs> that is the people's money. President Ben Ali himself, he has about $11 billion all over. He has properties in France, in Argentina, in many other nations. So uh, the same goes for Mubarak, who's been also scrutinized, and his family, about the funds that they took out of out of Egypt and so on. So the money is, is there, you know, but this is like one effort that they made to basically uh, buy, you know, people and, and make sure that um, the revolution would not stop. I have a couple of slides, if you don't mind. I can go through them and then we take more questions. Is that okay? okay. All right, thank you. All right, so the social media has been a big thing. And my last question on this slide, I say, had we not had a social media, I think the issue would be a, com a completely different story. Because the, 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 the dissemination of information and the access to Facebook, Twitter, and uh, YouTube by many of these youth has made it possible to spread the word inside and outside the nation. I mean, I myself, as soon as 
September 17th. I've been following a couple of Facebook accounts where the individual is holding those accounts. They're posting constant events and constant developments by the minute. I mean, you can refresh the page and you see something new that happened that specific day. And all of these are uh, uploaded videos uh, taken by phones and so on. So technology, in, in a way, has been a big time threat and it did succeed in really pushing away many of those dictators, uh, especially in Tunisia and, and in Egypt. Uh, and, and, and the way that things, you know, these youth were kind of coordinating things out and trying to organize, uh, you know, spread the word about a particular demonstration in such and such location uh, and, and calling for gays to sit in and, uh, uh, you know, organize events. This has been really, I think, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, emergence of, of the internet. And, uh, and that's why as soon as things start to get bad in Egypt, I mean, the government decided to shut down the entire internet project. Uh, they tried, and they're doing the same here in Syria. They've done it in Libya because they knew uh, that this is a danger. And they cannot anymore uh, present one version of the events that we used to uh, back in the 70s and 80s and 90s, or whatever phase the official TV station, the pro-regime TV station and pro-regime media who basically believed in it 100%. Yesterday I was watching the Syrian TV satellite and they were presenting a completely distorted view of what goes on in Syria. They were presenting those soldiers and policemen who were killed as martyrs. Basically they forgot about the 300 plus people who were killed by the police and so on, but they were really praising the families and they were showing people who were crying, you know, families of police officers and, uh, you know, military who were killed by, according to them, those terrorist movements that are taking place and shaking up in, in, in Syria. Okay, so it is a totally radical uh, opposite directions and thank God we have now the internet, we have the, uh, we have the uh, satellite channels located specifically Al Jazeera uh, because as I said, without it, we would not know many of what goes on and what happens in the internet. And that's why in Egypt, uh, uh, in Tunisia as well, Al Jazeera uh, crews were kicked out of the nation, uh, out of the country. Many of them were beaten, some of them were jailed because they were saying what's going on. They were reporting that what's going on, okay? Now, we might have, we might need another lecture perhaps to talk about Al Jazeera to some who, who might be interested because Al Jazeera has been uh, kind of looked at now by a bit of bias where they would raise <coughs> a lot of the issue that goes on in the nation that are maybe not 100% friendly with them, but they would ignore uprisings that are happening in places uh, that are friendly to them, like the case of Bahrain. Bahrain has 80% Shia, 20% Sunni, and they have a big time uprising. Many people were killed there. Yet, it is said that Al Jazeera did not report as it did in other cases like Libya, Tunisia, and Egypt, and so on. Why? Because they have more connection with the Bahrainis, uh, and then the Saudi are pressing them not to disclose a lot of information. So uh, media fairness uh, is, is an issue. I don't see the Al Jazeera English, and I think they've been reporting as I'm saying, so I, I don't see the problem, but maybe uh, there, are, there are cases to be made with that. We'll see where we go, okay? Uh, so uh, the social media factor has been essential, and it did really play a major role in really pushing and boosting those revolutions across the Arab world, okay? How did the West behave in this whole thing? Uh, we know it, there was uh, decades of uh, uh, complaisance by the West and uh, they were basically supporting those leaders that were in place since uh, uh, many, many years. And the whole thing was to uh, support who you know as opposed to who you don't know, all right? So it was a matter of, uh, uh, they did not want to run into some sort of uh, ambiguous uh, situations where they would maybe support opposition elements uh, who were uh, unpredictable, they might have religious ties and things like that. So it was mostly like a, uh, a one-way street where the uh, uh, many uh, Western nations were pro-regime, okay, uh, given the money, given the financial aid, and the know-how, uh, to the point that I'm listing a couple of examples there. As early as things started to get bad in Tunisia, the French foreign minister, uh, he uh, went to the parliament and, and offered the uh, support of the French police, you know, so that they could go there and teach the Tunisian police um, how to quell or to stop demonstrators without killing many of them. That was her suggestion. Uh, so she ended up having to resign her post there and uh, because of the pressure and uh, once one foreign minister of a nation that believes in democracy, fraternity and liberty uh, did not really uh, say something like that, 
Uh, a similar thing was said by Jacques Chirac before her, who said in TV saw Foy when he was visiting the nation uh, that uh, you Tunisians should be happy and satisfied that you have bread on the table, that you have food on the table, why should you ask for, in other words, for democracy? Why should you call for democracy? And he was pretty much criticized uh, because of what he said there. So uh, the support of the West has really led to this kind of animosity. And uh, Hillary Clinton, when she went to Tunisia, uh, you know, were meeting with Bouchard and uh, many people kind of uh, uh, took her to the building where she was supposed to sort of uh, participate in a debate on, on one of the Tunisian uh, TV channels. So uh, because of the thinking that the Americans have been really pretty much spoiling the dictators, why now you're coming back and telling us, yeah, we want democracy there and you're supporting it, okay? What else did the West say, uh, uh, did, uh, do? Actually, they uh, contributed militarily to the crisis in Libya. And by the way, that's gonna really shift the uh, whole process there and it's gonna really uh, change the way things are going uh, because we're moving from one peaceful, uh, civilian-driven, uh, you know, um, home-driven event, revolution, to one that's being supported by the West, by the military, uh, one of the mightiest kind of uh, powers on, on, on Earth, okay, through NATO and whatnot. So that's gonna really skew a little bit the trend that we've, least, we've seen at least at the uh, at the level of Tunisia and Egypt. And some think of this as uh, trying, uh, you know, the West trying to ride those events and trying to kind of uh, bandwagon and show the good spirit and the goodwill uh, to support democratic uh, uh, movements and stuff. Here's a summary, I've showed it before, I like it because it's a little bit funny, uh, of a summary of how the US was behaving uh, in terms of its support for Egypt. Okay, this is from the Post, okay? Here we go. I mean, who are we to judge this man? He's only been president of Egypt for 30 years. <laughs> He's still in his first term. <laughs> and he is a staunch ally of America. Just ask President Obama, President Bush, President Clinton, the other President Bush, <laughs> President Reagan, President Carter, <laughs> President Lincoln, and King George III. Mubarak <laughs> is our friend. And we know Mubarak is our friend because we pay him to like us. Specifically, we pay him $1.3 billion a year. But folks, listen up, that money buys us security. Remember, we haven't had a single mummy attack on U.S. soil. But, but the Egyptian people are angry, so they should hold a special election to choose their leader. Whether it's Hosni Mubarak, voice of experience, or business tycoon, Hosno Mubarak, or... Egypt's first female president, Hosna Muburka. Oh, hello, Cleopatra. All right, so that sums up for you uh, the whole picture about foreign policy and, and you know, the aid we give to these situations. Okay. Uh, one last, a couple of words here. Um, I hope I, I'm still keeping you awake here and whatnot. Uh, the, I mean, what is the significance of this event? I mean, it's true we talk about revolutions, and revolutions are good in many ways. Uh, but I think when you talk about the context of the Arab world, these revolutions are pretty much monumental. I mean, they're significant. We have been seeing something like this happening since perhaps the 1990s or, or late 1980s with the Tiananmen Square event in, in China, in addition to the Berlin Wall uh, dismantling and, and things like that. So it's been like 20 years or so we haven't seen such dramatic uh, political developments that took place. And, and that's why these, these are, uh, events are big. And specifically, when we talk about the geopolitical context, the importance of the Arab world to maybe the West in terms of oil, uh, you know, oil <coughs> policies with Israel, the Middle East conflict, and things like that. So these are like pretty much interesting and pretty much significant events in, in many ways, okay? What did they do? What can we learn from them? Uh, they taught us or told us that the Arab masses are, are ready to uprise, to rise up against their rulers, okay? They could do it. Uh, and as I mentioned the literature earlier on, what it said, and many people had the idea that the Arab masses would be the passive ones, they would never call for change, they would never be motivated to kind of uh, change the status quo and whatnot, but these events did show us the opposite, okay? Uh, and then they demonstrated this in a peaceful way, okay? There was no religion, there was no group, no political party that kind of claimed to be, uh, you know, behind these revolutions, okay? Uh, so that is a good thing. It is really a, a spontaneous <coughs> event that took place, uh, culmination of so many years of oppression, and, and the result is what we saw, a, a very much clean, 
well organized, uh, you know, a spontaneous popular uh, movement. Okay, so what what is the end that we don't have this fear that took place before that? Uh, again, going back to my example from the 1970s, as soon as we had a curfew, remember the bread riots in Tunisia? As soon as the curfew was in instituted, nobody would be there after six o'clock. That was not the case in Tunisia in these past couple of months. When we had the curfew, people still were going out demonstrating the same way in Egypt. They had a curfew, the army there, nobody was really killing, nobody was killed. So because they were so much uh, determined what they achieved, what they intended to achieve. And this will also be uh, basically the, the politics of the region for so many years to come. Uh, people are now asking for more demand. We cannot keep being both uh, nations uh, in Tunisia and Egypt, and people are, uh, you know, taking to the street uh, in TV, uh, TV and newspapers, buildings. Uh, people are kicking out the old guard, you know, uh, you know, uh, CEOs and whatnot who are from regime <coughs> who are now trying to change, you know, basically the uh, clothing and trying to advocate the revolution and so on and things like that. So people are in, in charge, basically. Uh, but then again. Uh, the economy might suffer, and, and that's why uh, we might talk about a new era. So democracy is in, in practice, is being kind of implemented uh, to a point, but democratization takes time, okay? It is a, uh, an open-ended process. It is a fluid process here, and we don't know uh, what will be the outcome. Uh, nobody knows. It happened in many other nations, so uh, we could end up with a, 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 a democratic regime, institutions, separation of powers, and whatnot. Uh, but things could go back to the uh, old status quo. Some examples that uh, we have seen in Africa, especially in Ivory Coast and uh, uh, in Kenya, where uh, they had elections and the president did not want to move up. He said, uh, I won the elections uh, and, and I could not go away. And what happened in Ivory Coast in recent weeks by the you know, intervention militarily by France and the United Nations uh, to kick out Bagbo, who lost the elections, by force, basically. So anything could come back and happen in the Arab uh, states uh, after the dramatic revolutions, but uh, you never know. Uh, what could we end up with in terms of democracy? Uh, my take on this, uh, in both nations, the influence of the youth group is pretty much high. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Fatiya, and Nahda, you know, the Renaissance Party in Tunisia, they have a lot of the uh, masses behind them. They're, they're pretty much the most organized political party in there. Uh, so uh, we might end up with a democracy that kind of uh, answers, you know, to the custom traditions of those Arab nations, and that does not necessarily ex exclude uh, Islam and uh, you know religion from the context, because uh, as we, whether we like it or not, Islam and religion in, in the Middle East is like pretty much important, and it is perhaps difficult to completely alienate it from the uh, political uh, landscape. Okay, a couple of. Uh, uh, notes here on uh, what might make a democracy endure or succeed. A number of books were written in this regard, Robert Dahl, uh, Adam Shavorsky, and things like that. They studied you know, the connection between the economy and, and other, other factors. And uh, it, it seems that when the military, the police, are kind of excluded from the equation, uh, you know, then perhaps there is a, a strong trace of success of the uh, democratic transition. In addition, uh, to the importance of the economy. And as I said, as we speak, the economy in Tunisia is suffering big time. Tourism is shut down dramatically in many hotels, kind of shutting down because of the violence that's been going on there and the fear of tourists to come in and visit. Uh, many, many, many industries are suffering from uh, strikes and uh, demonstrations and riots, and that is uh, expected that the rate of growth in Tunisia might be at about 0% for the 2011. Okay, so. Unless these things are resolved, you know, uh, unless uh, people show a clear support of democracy, and that's why I make a distinction between entrenching versus uh, instrumental support of democracy. Instrumental, that is, you're supporting democracy because you think democracy will bring you better economy, better living conditions, and so on. Uh, it should not be the case here, but uh, uh, many people might think of it uh, this way. And uh, as I said, there are a number of conditions. Uh, uh, only time will tell whether these revolutions will make it through and bypass those burdens. And, uh, but at least in, my, hum in my, my humble view, I think that it is with the development, it, it is with the, it set the tone high, and uh, hopefully time will not go against uh, these movements. So uh, that's as far as my presentation <coughs> here, and I'll be glad to take any, any questions or entertain any comments about what goes on here. I thank you for your time.